tonight. It's uh, a little after seven, time we got going here. Uh, all right, grew up in Indiana, used to go to the Big Line LA out in downtown Chicago. And he got a, a bachelor's degree of electrical engineering at Valparaiso University. And he moved out here to the West Coast and went to work for Boeing and then earned a master of software engineering. And he was also an RC aircraft and he liked to look at birds. He was really known around the 4th Division of uh, going to clinics. Uh, he, when I lived in Kirkland, I, I would see him a lot at the Eastside Clinic, Seattle Clinic, uh, and other ones down there. He founded the Monroe Clinic, ran it for five plus years, and uh, it eventually morphed into what's called the Snohomish Rail Fans, sort of more of a prototype rail fans type thing. Back in 2012, somewhere in there, Nick helped me out here, Tom, we would carpool over to Oak Harbor and see yes. the, the clinic there because this one didn't exist, right? Right. You and yep. I don't, John, were you part of that group? Mm -hmm. right. anyway. Myself, Nick, you and Ted. Ted, yeah, the four, four of us. us. We would carpool over there and one night riding back, somebody said, well, why don't we start our own clinic in Mount Vernon? <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, here we are, 2015. Uh, we uh, started this clinic. And during the pandemic, he wasn't going to let shut things down. He uh, got onto Zoom and away we went. So this was uh, before we started this one, and Ted is right there. And there's some other neat folks. There's Susan and Phil. Uh, other names, and Rich is looking like, what the heck are you taking my picture for? Uh, there's Tom. Right, Tom? I can't see that. <laughs> okay, that's Tom. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> One of his favorite clinics that he gave several times was Ted's Tubs of Tricks and Tips, and he would bring in a big container and have it on the counter, and he would just start reaching in and pulling out stuff and talking about it, and <laughs> you, you, you never knew. And, and the next time he would do it, a year or two later, it was different stuff. So it was kind of his thing. He was building a hand laid turnout in this photo. In uh, 2017, we had an all day Saturday event here where we had tables set up for different clinics and Ted was uh, doing a DCC program. Al Lowe is on the right. He's a noted end scale uh, model railroader. And I don't know who the others are. Ted and Doug Greenfield at the Anacortes Club. Ted is, but I don't think he was threatening to shoot him. <laughs> And Ted and Ron Gutsman are checking out a building. This is at the PSMREE layout in Tacoma. And uh, Paul Corrin, I think he wrote with us a few times too. Anyway, he's there, Ted, and I'm not sure who this is. In fact, I don't even recognize that structure. So, anyway, Ted and Unknown looking over Nick's layout. So I put another picture in the next layout. Hosting a Zoom clinic, right, in his little workshop. And you notice in the background there's a, uh, what's it called, an oscilloscope, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. And he was quite heavy into electronics and um, associated things. In uh, 2016, he won the Golden, Cla Golden Grab Iron Award. It's an award that is given out annually in the fourth division. <clears throat> and it is the, the, the previous three years award winners get together to figure out who the next one will be. So it's just kind of passed on down. So he was, he won in 2016 and then he was part of the committee in 17, 18, and 19. And these uh, are past award winners, Jim Sable of Tacoma, Russ Segner in uh, Newcastle, and Jim Youngkins in Olympia. He was the PNR librarian. This is back when, we, when paper was all we knew about. We didn't have digital copies of stuff. And so he, he maintained the PNR library. That's the region that's above the division, uh, which is now located at uh, Burien. Wasn't it? Somebody was just telling me that, where you were. That's where you got that picture. Yeah, huge repository of printed material. So SC and W, Swamp Creek and Western was uh, the club that just disbanded in Edmonds, uh, the train station. 
And you would always often see them in clinics uh, and, and regional meets, mini meets, division meets, NMRE conventions. I ran into them in Madison, Wisconsin, and Portland, and San Jose. He liked to go to conventions. He was good at CAD. He helped people design things. He taught a series of clinics on Zoom about using Arduinos. Um, it was really had a, quite a following, and it was a big hole was left when he was hospitalized. And then he co-founded and was the face of our clinic here. This picture is near and dear to me because I gone many places with Ted, uh, whether I drove or he drove, but I, I don't know what you call it. He was a very visual person, I guess. He, he could see something in his mind, and it was always this, this small, you know, and he would, he would and now he's driving, right? And he would be showing me. <laughs> yeah, that was just, that was Ted, right, Tom? John, yeah. So. We're fortunate we lived. <laughs> So Ted is in a better place now, probably. Who would like to make any comments? It's Bob. Oh, are you not making a comment? But I got to find out. I got to right. bring the camera in to allow for it first. Let's, uh, all right. Well, I'll kick it off. Sure. Hey, I met Ted about I think it was 2004. Went to the Monroe uh, swap meet and met uh, Ron got to more and I bought some stuff off of him at a table he had. And Ron uh, invited me over to his house and Ted was over there. And then after that, Ron and Ted started coming to my house every Tuesday night in Granite Falls. I have my layout up there, my pre-divorce layout, okay? <laughs> and they would come over every Tuesday night. Now I was, was an electronics guy that I knew how to wire DC. Okay. Paul Mallory had taught me how, how to solder when I was about maybe 13 years old, and everything was toggle switches, you know, the old way. Well, Ted comes over and Ron, and like, oh, you got to change this. you got to get up to the times. Okay? So Ted uh, uh, went and rewired my entire railroad for D DCC, as we have been in 2005, got a di Digitrack system because that's what Ted and Ron were using. And then after that, Ted uh, tried handling some switches, they were awful. Ted fixed them all for me, got everything ready. Ted just did all kinds of stuff mechanically to make my railroad better and to teach me. And the other thing I learned is driving with Ted, like you said, I'd offer, we're gonna go someplace, I'd offer to drive, Ted, Ted always drove. Okay, and we seemed to always go to to the uh, a burger joint to eat, and it was what five guys. Five five guys is always his favorite. But Ted is the one who really taught me a lot of basics I didn't know because for all these years on a railroad I was always living out in the middle of nowhere. Never had any other model railroads around me until Ted and Ron started coming around and teach me how to interact with others, get, get involved with, with the 4D, and I owe all that to Ted. So that's my memories of Ted. Good memories. Yes. And I, I second what you say about he drove, because I rode with him all the way to Boise and back, and I kept volunteering to drive. And, and no, no. I drove. He drove, yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Jim? Yeah. Good. Hi guys, I'm Jim. Uh, I've only been here in the Pacific Northwest this time since 2018-19. Grew up in Anacortes and was a model railroader as a child and left it when I was about 12 or so. I remember when I went off to college, my mom called and said, oh, by the way, <laughs> I gave your trains away. <laughs> what? <laughs> I had a big collection of Lionel stuff in a box in the attic, and she just gave it away. Oh, uh, but, so then I moved to San Jose, and I got 
back into model railroading in 87, somewhere along there, late, middle to late 80s. And I was a member of a club, and then I started going to NMRA events, and conventions, and got into ops, and et cetera. And so my community of model railroading got bigger and bigger, and then I had to move. It was time. I won't bore you with that story. But I came up here, and I was very uncomfortable about the fact that all of my model railroading community was in California. Met Ted and was like, he was the most inclusive person you could talk to. He always wanted to help, he always greeted everybody, etc. He kept, he knew my name from the first time he met me. Uh, <coughs> It was just, you know, I loved the fact that I always knew that there was somebody out there that I considered to be a friend, and from him, I've met all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate that. Good, good memories. Anybody else? The guy in the orange sweatshirt. That would be the, that, that. This means that you're next because it's going down the road. Well, Ted used to uh, camp come over when I started doing. <clears throat> I had Thursday meetings at my place to work on my layout, and Ted came over with Al and uh, a couple other people who are not here and have not been to the meetings. I doubt that many of you would know them, but uh, Ted always had advice for the layout, which was helpful. But before that, uh, as Al said, we would go to the clinics over in Oak Harbor. <clears throat> and the drive was always interesting, without fail, because like he said, things were this big, but he had to show you, as he's driving, that they were like that. that and you just hoped that by the time he turned around the road, it was still in front of you. Because he... <laughs> and we'd always go, before the, the clinic, we would always go over to that, I forget the name of that restaurant, you guys remember. Oh. The Greek place. San Remo? What was the San name? Remo, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So one night we're over there, and I said to Ted, because uh, he was, he, he always ordered pizza then. I mean, I know he had, he also liked burgers, and he'd like the uh, brats at Costco until they discontinued him, and I think he was considering seriously boycotting Costco because they <laughs> no longer served the brats. So once a year I'd have a, a luncheon, and I always had brats, and that's all Ted would eat would be brats. But we went to this restaurant, and I said, so Ted, have you ever had Uzo? And he got the funniest look on his face. His, well, you know, it, those of you who know Ted, he never drank. But he said, oh, yeah, Uzo. <laughs> and apparently when he was in college, he and a roommate of his took two gals out on a date. And the two of them, the two guys, ended up consuming everybody's Uzo to the point that Ted became violently ill. And I said, well, you need a glass of ouzo. So I bought him a glass of ouzo, which he drank, and he also had a bowl of pomoni that night. So, um, he, he, he always had a smile, and he always had, uh, like I said, he always had advice. Uh, I think when he would come over to my place, he enjoyed as much as John and I were talking about earlier. He would enjoy as much working on the layout as he did sitting and talking about working on the layout. And then talking some more about working on the layout. And then talking some more about it. But uh, we did get work done. And, and uh, we're actually changing the name of the, I'm gonna change the name of the, uh, the lumber mill. There's a lumber mill he was working on, which he wanted to call Palmer Lumber after his grandfather. And we're gonna rename it the Becker Palmer. Columbia so, so he will have his name on that. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Nice tribute. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. That's great. Somebody else? I never had the pleasure of meeting them, but I got a question. Sure. By chance, those Arduino Zoom sessions get uh, <coughs> recorded or on YouTube or anything like they that? They are. Oh, Bob, are they on YouTube or the 4D site? Or I think, yeah, they're on the yeah. 4D site. Go to the 4D. Uh, slash and the dot com 
website, and I'll look around and see if I can find it for you too. But yeah, he, I might, know he was recording them because they were out there somewhere. Used to be on dot io of some kind. Group, groups. Oh yeah, groups io at, at groupsio.com. Yeah. And they might be on. I'll the, track it down. I think I know where to find it. So they might be on the 4D channel. So I meant when you all started coming over to the Ocaro meeting, which is when I found out that Al was one of the original founding members of the Oak Harbor group in the 70s. Am I correct? Well, it was the Whidbey Island Model Railroad Club, yeah. 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 So he was always, and I was fairly new when I first met you guys, and I was slightly intimidated because of the skill level they had, because I didn't get involved in railroading until Phil and I got married in 2005. And then for a year, I just sat and watched him work. And then one day, he said, you want to make some rocks? And the next thing I knew, I was up on top of the railroad putting rocks up on our mountain that we had. And I was like, this is really cool. This is fun. <laughs> so anyways, Ted, Ted was always massively supportive. And a smile on his face and a hug. And then we all had to go to Zoom. And we didn't see anybody. And then one night, I don't know if he was doing the clinic or if he was just visiting the clinic on Zoom, but we were the last ones still in the room. And it was just Ted and Phil and I. And we talked, I think for 40 minutes, 45 minutes, long after everybody else had left, we talked about everything. We talked about life, we talked about trains, we talked about... But the one thing he tickled me the most with is his designing of the little circuit boards. Mm -hmm. Because yep. he found that I told him that I used to work at Technical Services in Old Carter, mm -hmm. and I soldered circuit boards. So he would go to great lengths to talk about what this little circuit board he designed <laughs> would do. And I stood there, and I finally I said, you know, I just soldered them. I have no clue what they do. <laughs> <laughs> I know a resistor from, uh, gee, I can't even remember now. It's been three years. But anyways, it always used to make me laugh because I go, Ted, you know, all we had to do was solder. We didn't know how, we didn't have to know what they did. Unless a pain, a, we know, we knew we soldered some boards for Boeing. We didn't know which bro boards they were, but every time a plane crashed, we would all look at each other and go, oh my God, I was really yeah. not that. <laughs> but it turned out most of our boards made the seats work. They, they worked on the TVs and stuff in the radio. We didn't do a lot of really top secret stuff. But anyways, that was my story about Ted, and he always made me feel great, and whatever I was doing, he was extremely interested, and he was so much fun. And Thank I'm going to miss him. Very nice. I appreciate that. Ted uh, was the face of this clinic, and I was the behind-the-scenes guy, and so we communicated by email pretty much almost daily, I would say, over the last 10 years. And some of you know Lauren Clark, who uh, I've met him through a forum, and he lives in Mill Creek, and so the three of us got this three-way e email conversation going all the time, back and forth, and, and uh, yeah. Anybody else? Okay, let's move on here. Okay, tool time. Who brought a tool or a product or something to share and tell us about? Anybody? Nick? Yeah, so you know, I've been in the hobby a long time. <coughs> One of my favorite cements from many years is Goo. Walther's Goo. It's an orange colored contact cement. Oh, yeah. They don't make it anymore. What? They don't? Nope. You go online, you can't find it. It's all back ordered, oh, unavailable. Oh, oh my gosh. So I looked online for an alternative, and somebody suggested this. It's 3M Yellow Super Weather Strip Gasket Adhesive. Fast drying, exceptional strength, firm bond. It looks like goo, except it's not orange, it's yellow. Uh, it uh, performs just as well, or perhaps a little better, they said, and I think so too. So I'll just pass it around. If you're looking for a replacement for goo and can't get it, this stuff really works well. Would you send me a link or the particulars sure. to it? So I, that was too much for me to write down. The, the title yeah. was too, yeah. Okay, it good. It smells bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I grew up with goo. Anybody else? Bring a tool? Yes, Roger. Hi, Roger. Good to see so, you back. Thanks. So I've been using one of the, a fidget popper toy as a paint palette. A what? Fidget popper toy. So it's supposed oh, to be yeah. like oh, yeah. it's supposed to be like uh, basically like bubbles where you can pop them and just play with it back and forth. Yeah. For kids who fidget. They have a whole series of yeah. fidgets. They do. Thousands, yeah. Can you hold it up so you can there see it? things that you twist when you're nervous. ADD, ADD. Yeah, or <laughs> neurodivergent. Okay. Why don't you pass it around and then yeah. talk to me in the break so I can get this information out. I have no clue what you're even talking about. Yeah. So basically, it's a silicone little toy that I've been using for painting and for non, oh, yeah. for easy to right. do glues, where when, once they dry, you just push it out wow. instead of having to clean your palette out. Yep. Okay. Oh, that's good. Okay. That's good. Where, do you, yeah. where do you find these things? I got mine off Amazon. Of course. Yeah. Under fidget toys. The online hobby shop. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? No. Mark. I didn't bring yeah. them, but we got to talk about them the other time. <coughs> For extra clamps, small clamps when gluing things together, there's two things. There's in the hair department, there's little claw things yeah. about, I don't know, about three quarters of an inch square that I clamp. And the, one of those claws will hit what I need, usually. So I, I, use, I just put a bunch of them in, the, uh, in front of me and I start gluing things together and claw, put the claws together. The other thing is years ago, I don't know if they still make it, ladies. But there's these long, inch, inch and a half metal hair things. You just you squeeze the back of them and then you clip the hair in. Yeah. What? A clippy. Clippy thing, yeah. yeah. What I did is the ends, they sit Correct. flat, but on the ends I bend them in slightly and they reach, they'll reach in places where you want to hold the glue for a long time. Yeah. Part, hold that part. So it's just two little ideas, yeah. but I didn't bring any with me. Didn't, well, you're going to have to send me a picture so I know what the heck you're talking yeah, about. I can do that. All right. <laughs> Good deal. Anybody else? Well, yeah, one more. Okay. This isn't exactly a tool. This is another work in progress. You pull it out. So you might have seen my box down here. Carrying cases are always something that that folks. I'm going to come around the front with this. Uh, that people that people need. I found these latching ones at, uh, at Michaels, and usually you get them on sale for a good price. But what do you do to put stuff in? Well, I found these trays at the dollar store. And two of them will fit side by side. Yeah, this way too, so you can get on the camera right in here. Now you have to cut them apart to nest them, but I did that, and it works. Good then, I, then I reinforce them underneath so they don't uh, play around. And I discover you can't if you have extensions on here because these things angle in. You can stack these three high. What are you reinforcing them with? Just one, just over an uh, eighth inch uh, basswood. Yeah. But I had to add, these are 12 inch strips only fit directly across the bottom. So I had to create some extenders out of uh, some other wood that I had on hand. Then, when you want to put equipment in there, since I'm an end scale, I found these at the dollar store. And you can, well, this one's too big, but you can put it right in here, add some extenders, and I'm working on gluing foam. so it'll keep it nice and soft. The trick is getting the foam to stick. I'm still working on that. i got to try a different spray adhesive. The one I bought turned out to be really low quality. We can do a test right now. Yeah, <laughs> well, that, that might melt the foam. I'm not sure. 
Uh, I'm testing a, a glue at home right now to see if What see department did you find the metal in? Uh, Dollar Tree. Crafts. Yeah, yeah that's a craft thing. Looks like corrugated this is a full size one. Corrugated metal. Oh, G-scale roofing. roofing. Exactly. Yeah. Now this I had to uh, I had to cut it up uh, cut it up with a motor tool, but uh, but otherwise uh, to get it fit. But uh, it's right now as proof in concept. Uh, it seems to be working. What do you use it for? Uh, I'm going to be putting um, uh, in scale equipment um, in here, fitting it to corrugations, like I've seen on uh, some of the other guys' uh, things that they that they bring in. Hmm. Cool. And then I'll use bubble wrap on on top of each so it doesn't move around. Gotcha. All right. Thanks, Phil. Appreciate that. Okay. First time showing up and. You brought something to share with us. That's great. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so finally, this is a light. I found out about it on the forum that I free Amazon. And the reason it's really cool is <laughs> when you <laughs> drop stuff on the floor, like we do, and like yesterday I dropped a little tiny, this is Ted, but a little tiny screw. 256 screw to holding a truck, it's supposed to hold a truck on and it bang on the floor. Oh man. So you get down, put this and you put it right on the side and then shoot it along the floor and it's, it casts a nice wide beam and then there it is. So anyway, I'll put a link in the uh, in the newsletter as to where you can get those. And it's USB uh, recharging, no batteries. Okay, moving on to Modeler Showcase. Uh, we have some nice models back there. We gotta go back here and get some lights back on again. Uh, Nick, why don't you tell us what you brought? Well, I'm still working on building to the town of Decatur, and there's three of them back there. One is just a shed. The other is, I think it was a restaurant, but when I was there, it was a recreation center. I think they were, you know, cards and billiards and and the th last one with the uh, framed-in back wall is my mother-in-law's physician's office in Decatur, Arkansas. So they never finished that back part, so it was fun with the lasers to cut out all the little studs and braces. One thing that you should take a look at, and that is, uh, let's see if I can find the right picture here. Let's see. Well, somehow I lost the one I'm looking for. The building has a peculiar kind of stone surface. Now, I had a picture that I took when I was there. It's a three-quarter view. The lighting isn't real good. Uh, how to reproduce that stone? So I got some N-scale engineering. N-scale, is that right? Yeah, yeah. N-scale architect. N-scale architect. Stone embossed plastic stone material. And I made it out of that, but you know, the stones didn't look like this. They were much tinier. I can imagine trying to go and highlight some of them light brown, some of them dark brown. I, <laughs> so, this is the miracle. I went to Decatur on Google Maps, and there is the building, and there is the stonework in full sunlight. So, I took that into, I used Microsoft Digital Image Pro and created a sheet of stone paper. I got rid of the telephone pole, got rid of the windows, so I had a sheet of just stone paper. And the next thing I did was to print it on decal paper. And then you can you imagine putting the decal paper on and trying to cut the window openings? So the same laser file that cut the building itself, I used to cut the decal. So it fitted on perfectly with, uh, I don't need to cut out the windows and worry about all that. And you may have seen, I've seen in a Model Railroad magazine, somebody, I think New England, Berkshire, and Western used to do this, take a picture of a old brick factory. And they would make a decal that covered the whole side of the building. So all of the patch brick here and the ghost sign there, all of that stuff was on there and it was all the decal. 
very impressive. Well, in the end, it was serendipity because because I made the building out of that N scale architect brick stuff, the side is not smooth. It has bumps. It's the, it's the N scale architect material showing through the decal, so it gives the impression of depth. But I got <laughs> the actual stone of the actual building. <laughs> yeah, gee whiz. Okay, thank you. Um, who else brought stuff back there? I know I did, but I think I see some more. Anybody? Going up to it? Mark? Yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> back there's, there's two kits. Step one is take it out of the box. Step two is put everything on it, paint it. It's done, right? Real fast. Actually, I don't know, I spent probably 12 hours on the, the finished passenger car, but they're two identical passenger cars from uh, two different companies. And one of them is the old, the old case Streamliner I've had since I was probably in high school and just never put it together. That's the one that isn't done yet. But an identical one is a Kasner kit that uh, Jack Tainstad donated to me here a couple years ago when he was cleaning house. He gave me a couple of kits that he, doesn't, he wasn't going to put together. So I finally did it and uh, put it together. And then I had uh, Cliff do some decal work. I printed them out on a uh, word processing and got the right size of decal or the right size of font and Cliff printed off a sheet of decals for me and so it says Silver Dollar Rocket it's got a car number on it so we it's a club conference putting that thing together and I've got about I, I painted eight cars up with that paint scheme for a, a car a train called the Silver Dollar Rocket and I've got uh, seven more of those metal extruded aluminum kits to put together. I decided not to drill for grab irons uh, because I had a hard time drilling a 16th inch diameter hole through the roof to get the roof vents on. And I wasn't going to break 50 bits trying to get the, <laughs> the grab irons. So none of those nine cars are going to have grab irons. <laughs> so you take a look at them. Okay, uh, Dave, tell, tell us about your uh, really nifty train over there. Well, I got, I'm not on the showcase deal over there, they were rolled off some Caterpillar equipment on uh, depressed uh, flat cars. There's uh, three or four Rocos on there and a couple of big Walters ones. And so all the smaller ones, I've uh, first time I've used chocks, I put chalk on the base, on the decks, and the company that makes these, if they only have like one more model, that's in, in our scale. So, But everything else, they go up to a $1,000 a piece uh, engines in there. So uh, anyway, that's, uh, I've got chain on all of them, but one, one has a cable. And I'm going to try to get it so it looks like it's got a ratcheting uh, lockdown on it. But anyway, that's it. Good. Thanks, Dave. You can get uh, 187th ratchets, you know. I, I ordered some and got them. They're pretty tiny, but you can do them, so you can put them in line with the chains. Uh, who else? Anybody besides me? Jeff. More NN3. Uh, Dendron Rear Grand Western Class 48 Switcher. It's an Aspen model. It'll be the last uh, Aspen model I get, not because I don't like them, but because they aren't offering it anymore after 30 years in the catalog. This one I decided to let her uh, do all the paint and put a wood pile on it. Following it is a, um, a combine car for a tram road. Uh, it's the third one I built because the first one I screwed up the paint job. The second one I didn't like the windows on it, so this is the third one. It's an MDC N scale Overton baggage car, but I narrowed it, shortened it, built a new roof put in a pair of uh, Denver South Park Pacific trucks from uh, Shapeways and uh, new end railings and painted it for niche to try to uh, imitate the old Denver South Park and Pacific cabooses. And like I say, NN3 uh, Optivisor is absolutely necessary for this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's uh, remarkable. I'm going to have to take a close look at that. Have I got everybody but me? Okay. Oh, Phil. One more time. All right. <laughs> um, I decided to 
uh, once I had finally gotten back more or less full time in the hobby, uh, to actually scratch build something. Now, I go back in the hobby all the way uh, back to 1967. So I am thoroughly addicted to all those old combat how-to books. And I've got a copy of uh, uh, Bridges and Buildings from Model Railroads out of 1965. And I saw this little piggyback facility that was originally built for Santa Fe uh, in the uh, mid-50s. And uh, it looked like a project I could do. And so I started, I took the drawings. One of the drawings is half HO. I scaled that up a little bit. Uh, the pattern for the roof uh, parts of that were HO, scaled that down, and just started cutting wood pieces and, and carving, and I learned how to use a motor tool uh, to uh, cut up the uh, 16th inch metal tubing for the poles. And basically I've been learning as I've uh, as been going what techniques work, what techniques don't. Mm -hmm. Cutting things, making sure your wood doesn't split. Um, and a little bit that I discovered was that um, uh, using one of the pieces that I had pre-drilled uh, to put the poles in, using that as a um, uh, sort of an improvised jig for assembly, sticking some of, you'll see that there, sticking some of the poles through there, and then laying it on its side, laying the other piece on the side, and then I can use that to glue the, uh, glue the poles into the bottom of that. Now I've got to make one more piece like that, uh, so I can do that when I uh, do the other side. Um, I finished up the roof framing. I didn't bring a piece for the roof because I decided to change what was uh, going to happen. The, uh, um, basically, I have some uh, uh, kind of like wood siding that would uh, be suitable for uh, a corrugated aluminum roof. And, uh, but for the most part, I'm following just the instructions right there in the uh, in the original article, which was published sometime in the late 50s, early 60s, in Model Railroad, and um, it's working. Good. <laughs> so you'll, it's in pieces, but you'll see it back there as, uh, to where, where the progress is right now. I often wonder when I see those callback plans and stuff if anybody ever does them. Now I know. Okay, I'll wrap this up real quickly here so we can get going. I brought a structure in progress. It's a corner gas station used to be a radiator shop uh, in Seattle. There's pictures of it there. My good friend Nick went down, he took the pictures, made plans, drew up CAD plans, laser cut the wood <laughs> shell, N-scale architect, HO scale brick, um, laser cut that with the openings. And so that's all assembled um, to the point of windows in, at this point. And, uh, and it's, yeah, it's quite a, a challenge because Nick hands you a, a Ziploc bag and he says, kit number one of one. <laughs> <laughs> you can see through it, you see the parts, but there's no instructions. He says, well, a model of your, modeler of your caliber, and says, yeah, thanks. So it's been fun, it really has been fun. Um, the other thing is I brought two flat cars, one of which is right out of the box, and the other um, is weathered. As you, most of you know, I'm rather fond of weathering, and so you can look at the two and compare them and see the difference. Uh, the one has a trailer on it, so it's, it, it has been weathered also. Okay, kids, let's take a short break tonight because we're running a little late, and then Tom will regale us with his uh, track work. So uh, you don't need notes. Everything I'm going to say, I've gotten a handout. So just listen. If you got a question, just ask. Uh, the first thing, and this is about weathering track. And the first thing I would say to everybody, there's not one way to do it. And this isn't the best way. It's my way. It works for me. I like it. And if you don't, tough. But if you do like it, feel free to steal it or take part of it. Uh, it's stuff I've learned the hard way in many cases. Uh, I'll tell you a couple of things not to do. I'll start with a story. I decided, because I love track, to me, I mean, it's a railroad, right? It's the key, in my book, it's the key feature in the whole layout. 
And so I have no turnouts, for example, less than a number eight. I just don't want number fours or number twos or number ones or, you know, so the one, you know, one half that turns off. I want broad turnout so it looks realistic. And I wanted the track work to look good. So I, I decided I was going to put rail joiners down. Now you all know rail joiners in, in real life is what joins the ends of two rails. And since my layout's in the 50s, my rail joiners were every 39 feet. So I carefully went down on this one section of track and I put a scribe mark every 39 scale feet. And then I put a scale rail joiner on the rail. Do you know how small those suckers are? They are about maybe an eighth of an inch long. I will tell you now, don't bother. It is a total waste of your time. It, I mean, I even painted some of them red so I'd see them. And one of the quizzes when you walk in, in addition to, can you find Mike O'Brien's moose, which is in the logging part of the layout, can you find a rail joiner? And if you get it, you're, that's one of the key points. All right, so. <clears throat> Thanks, Al. We're all pressure. All right, thank you. So I'm going to sort of take you through the steps that I go through when I'm putting the track down. Um, I use cork uh, on top of uh, homeless oak. And uh, years ago, <laughs> I persuaded a very dear friend of mine um, to cut homeless oak for me. And he didn't just cut it in strips, but he cut it at a 45 degree bevel. Brian Jacobs, if any of you know Brian. Dear Brian, cut them for me. We didn't know it, but homeless oak makes an awful lot of dust. And he cut them in his garage. And when we were done, we didn't know it, but the box of his table saw was full of the shavings from this homeless oak, and he had a fire in his garage that he was able to get out just after he got the tank of oxygen out of the garage first. I, you don't need them. You don't. You don't need a bevel, but that's what I've done. So I, I put the I put the track <clears throat> on the uh, on cork then, and um, I use I used to use Ace. Everything I talk about, I've got a sample of. Ooh, wow! All right, Ace window and door. They don't. They, it's not. You can't buy this anymore. But this is made by DAP, and DAP still makes it. It's about six bucks for a tube this big. There is enough in there to do just about anybody's layout because you don't use very much. Apply it with a putty knife about like so. The width of the uh, cork and HO scale is just about right, but a thin strip down it. You put it on, put a weight on it, let it dry overnight. It takes three days to dry if you're doing a, a real construction job, but if you're putting down a uh, track, overnight's fine, and it'll hold it down. <clears throat> so. Like I said, Ace no longer carries it. Well, they may carry it as DAP, but they, they don't have their own brand anymore. Uh, the second thing you do is then <clears throat> is paint the rails. I've settled on Ceramco Walnut. Again, not the only answer. I've tried Black, uh, and I've tried Dark Burnt Umber. Uh, both are good. There's other dark colors that also work, but uh, this is the one I like. It's got just a little bit of red in it, so I like it. I don't think I can really see it, but I've convinced myself I do. And I, one of the funny stories was when I was painting this, Ted was over, and Ted took great issue with how dark my rails were. <laughs> he took so much issue, in fact, that he went downtown stand when we used to at a Wayne's Cafe. Yeah. He walked over the tracks, took a picture of the rails to show me how much lighter the rails there were there <laughs> than they were on my layout. <laughs> and I said, hey, listen, I drive up to Canada every year. My wife and I have a cabin up in, on Quinnell Lake. We drive by miles of track. They've got rail greasers every two three feet because it's snaking through the canyon and the rails are black. That's what my rails are, damn it. <laughs> All right. So, um, again, any of them work, uh, but I prefer the walnut. Uh, I like to use a small round brush like this one. Again, you, all these things will be up here. You can take a look at them later. The reason I like a small round one, this happens to be a round number two 
The reason I like the roundness is because it, if you, you want to get underneath the rail flange, and if you use too fat of a brush or a flat brush, it tends to leave little streaks of unpainted side of the rail. So I use a number two, get it underneath the, the side of it, and paint it inside and out. Don't worry about how sloppy it is because you're not going to see it later anyway. Yes, sir? Do you clean the rail before you paint it? Do I clean the rail? No. Okay. I mean, I never thought of it to tell you the truth. No, I don't. I mean, it's, as, cl in, it's yeah. as clean as or dirty as it is coming out of the box. You know, I don't assume that it's gotten too dirty and it seems to stay on, so okay. haven't had a problem yet. Yeah. Do you clean the rail head after you paint it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll, that's, that's down the line here a bit. Yeah, but yes, I do. Um, and like I say, don't worry about getting paint on top of the rail. Then the, thing th the third thing you do is you paint the ties. Now, I've used... Martha Stewart, this is her number 15. Come to find out, Martha Stewart no longer has paint name under her name, so you can't buy this. It doesn't matter. This is a gray. See the color? Kind of a gray, right? Uh, I look Ceramco Drizzle Gray or Ceramco Platinum. Both come pretty close. It's just something that's kind of a dirty gray, not too dark and not too light. The one thing that you need to be careful of when you're putting it on is that you paint in the direction of the tie, not in the direction of the rail. If you do it in the direction of the rail, you leave streaks down the rail that don't look appropriate. So you do it, and I know it takes longer, but you do it each, each tie. It takes a little bit longer. For that, I use a... Uh, <clears throat> a flat brush. Um, I use a quarter inch brush. I've got a couple of them here. Quarter inch brushes. The reason I use a quarter inch flat soft brush is because I'm lazy and a quarter inch is just right to do two ties at once. If it was any narrower, I would only do a tie and a half. So I do a quarter inch and it does two ties. And yes, it does get the white or the gray in between the ties, but you don't care about that. You'll see, oh, I'm going to pass this around in just a minute. All right, so we've got, we've got the uh, rails painted. You've painted the ties. And then the next thing you do is you're going, to, you're going to apply the ballast. All right, so when I apply the ballast, and I'm going to, I was going to do this later, but I think I'll do it right now. Let me just take a second here, and I'll show you how quickly this goes up. When I started laying ballast, uh, when I started laying ballast years ago, it was, uh, you know, I got the, I don't know, I'm sure everybody's done it. You, you get the uh, little paper cup or you get the little plastic cup and you try to dribble it down there. <laughs> I'm thinking, I mean, I, I don't have a huge layout, but my, my main line's 220 feet. So that's a lot of feet. That's a lot of little paper cups, right? <laughs> so I went online, and I find these things. This is Prosis PRO. Again, you don't need notes. That's all in here. Prosis Ballast Spreader Car. Mine came with a glue dispenser. You can buy them with or without. I wouldn't waste your time on the glue dispenser. I don't like the way it dispenses glue. It relies on a little toggle and you either get too much or too little. And you end up having to go back and redo it all anyway. So I don't use it. Be your own judge. But I do use this car. And again, you can get these little cars. You can get them either with all the controls or just the box itself. The box is cheaper, but then you have to guide it. I like it with the wheels and the adjustments so that you can raise it or lower it depending on if you've got code 70 rail or code 100, you can raise it or lower it. I just crank it up and I put it down. So it's very simple. You put it on the, on the tracks like so. Is it, where's Bob? Bob, are you gonna see this? Because this is pretty cool. And by the way, when we're all done here, I'm going to encourage all of you, anybody who wants to, come up here and try this. It's, it's pretty slick. 
So you put the ballast in the car and you just make sure the wheels are on the track and you just run it down the track like that. We're done. Okay, now. I'm sorry? It fills it all in. It fills it in enough and then you turn it off and you get this brush and then you just go down the tra rails, right in between the rails, and brush it off the ties. Now I'm not going to spend the time, I mean, when I'm doing this for real, I take a little more time, I make sure every single particle I can get off between the tracks is off. And by the way, it's a waste of time because as soon as you put the glue on, whatever mixture you do, they'll float up on top of the tie anyway. So. Mm -hmm. Just do your best. Get it mostly off. And then you do the sides. And then the last thing I do is I take the side of the brush and I just kind of pat the side of the rail to smooth down the ballast. Okay? Again, it takes longer than I'm taking right now, but you get the idea. You do it until you're happy. And if you need a little more ballast here or there, you put it in. All right, so once, you, once you've got the ballast on, you're going to glue it. Now, I have up here, let me just scoop this out. I'm going to come around the other side just so I can yeah. shoot it off. I'm just going to put these on top for now. There's a lot of discussion as to, okay, I'm going to use glue. What am I going to use for glue? Am I going to use white glue or uh, matte medium? I've used both. I kind of prefer matte medium, but not so much that if I was doing ballast and I only had white glue, I'd definitely use white glue. But the question is, okay, if you're using either of these, what ratio? Is it 2 to 1, 4 to 1, 6 to 1, 8 to 1, 1,000 to 1? How much water to how much matte medium or how much white glue? So what I've got here, and you can come up and take a look at these later. Here's a 2 to 1 sample, a 4 to 1, 6 to 1, and 8 to 1. Those were all done with the Woodland Scenics ballast, which is made from walnut shells. Okay? The ballast that I use on my layout is Arizona Rock and Mineral, and it's real stone. And here's a sample in 8 to 1 and 4 to 1. I want you to come up and feel them and see how solid they are. You will notice, I think, that the ones that are of the uh, Woodland Scenics are a little more crumbly. They don't stick together quite as well. So you might want to take that into consideration. I would think you'd probably want to go a little more concentrated because this one, 8 to 1, is solid as a rock. No pun intended. It is rock. Okay. Do you put wet water on before you do the glue? I do not put what? No. The question was, do I put uh, wet water on? No. But I do, when I've got my mixture ready, I put about 10% alcohol. And I don't care, 70 or 90, doesn't matter, but about 10% alcohol in whatever ratio I've decided. I typically use 4 to 1 or 6 to 1. Also, um, let me see if I've missed anything there. I think the last thing I would say, and I've got this in my notes here, the thing I would do, whatever kind of ballast you're going to use, it may be something totally different. Am I too high? Oh, you're squatting. I see. I got it. I got it. Whatever ballast you're using, I would do a test. I would pour four little piles. I'd do one, two to one, whatever ratio you think you're going to use, and try each one and see what the results are. And you'll say, ah, that's the one for me. Because the ballast you use, may, maybe it absorbs a little more glue easier. I don't know. It, but it's worth throwing away a little bit of ballast and get yourself happy at the start than getting halfway through the job and saying, God, I wish I'd done that differently. All right. How do you apply the alcohol and the glue? When I, when I, first I mix it in the ratio that I want, and then I add about 10%. And again, 10% is eyeball. It's not exact. I use a pipette. I have tried spoons, 
uh, spray. spray bottles. Forget it. It just, all it does is blows the ballast everywhere and doesn't get it on. If you use a pipette and put it right down the middle of the tracks, it will go. And you can see whether it's going to work right away. You put it in the middle, the the ballast immediately turns darker, mm -hmm. and if it's going to soak through, you'll start to see it bleed out the side of the tracks. Just got to make sure you don't squeeze it too hard, right? Right, or else you'll, you'll blow it out from between the, t the ties, absolutely, yeah. If you, blow, if you just squeeze it gently, hold it at an angle, and just kind of squeeze it gently and go down the tracks. And then go back and do it again if you need. All right, but you want it, you want it to go all the way through and down to the edge of the ballast. And you'll see, when you first put it in, it may go down, oh, maybe a quarter of an inch. And the rest of the ballast is bone dry. Go back and put in a little more, and maybe it goes down a half an inch. Do it until you get a little bit of the blue showing at the bottom of the ballast. Even then, it won't have gone all the way to the bottom of the ballast. So I recommend you go back a, a later, after it dries, overnight at least, and put more glue on. You can't put on too much glue. I've done glue two, three, four times in some cases because it just becomes harder. And, and, and once it's on there, by the way, people ask, do the... Do the does the track want to come off? This stuff's pretty tight. I'm going to pass this around here in just a second. This is pretty tight with just the caulk on there. Mm -hmm. But once you get the ballast on, it ain't coming off. I guarantee you. It's on until you tear out the layout. Or your spouse says after you're gone. You know, it's, it's on there for the rest of the life. We can pass this around now. People think we're fine. Okay, so we got the ballast on. You're gonna let the you're gonna let the stuff you've got it glued. Now you're gonna let it dry. Make sure it's dry. I don't know your conditions. Uh, in my place, I've got uh, we're fortunate we have radiant floors, and even though I'm in the basement, it's always decent temperature and not very high humidity. So things tend to dry pretty fast. If I've got an area that I've been working on, I want it to dry. I've got a fan with just a, not a hard fan, just a little table fan. It just blow it across the area that you've been working on. It really helps it dry out faster. If while you're putting the glue mixture on, you notice that it's beating up even a little bit, stop and add more alcohol. Because it's just not, it doesn't have enough in there to break the surface tension. And as I say here in bold print, if it's loose at all, don't hesitate to put more glue on the ballast. All right, so now we're going to clean up the ballast. <clears throat> As I say here, in spite of how carefully you prepare the ballast, prying to gluing, there will always be things there after it dries. And between the tracks, there's no way you're not going to have pieces of ballast on the ties when you're done. I use this finger and this the thumb, and I just go right down the track. And I just keep doing it until all those pieces come off. They tend to, on the ties, particularly in the middle of the track between the rails, it tends to come off pretty quickly. Uh, because, you know, there's a lot of air you can get. I can get my whole thumb in there, but I can't get my whole thumb along the side of the rail, right? But in between my finger and my thumb, I can get most of that off, and when I'm off, now it's just loose pieces. I can take the brush and, and just brush them off. It comes off real quickly. On the side, I also use my thumb and forefinger, but it can get, it can get a little uh, dicey at times. Sometimes right up against the rails, it wants to snug up in there because remember, I've put the, I put with the pipette, I've just gone down the middle of the rails, so I haven't washed anything along the side of the outside of the rail. So on the inside, you, you know, if there's anything up against the rail, you've tended to wash it off. On the outside, you haven't, so it tends to stick there. So the first thing I'll do is a toothbrush. And a toothbrush will usually get most of it, but once in a while you'll get to a place where you didn't notice, but it was piled right over the top of the, of the tie plates, and you can't even see the tie plates anymore. In which case, do you all have dental tools? Mm -hmm. If you don't, uh, if you don't and you don't know this trick, ask your dentist. Your dentist, they throw these things away by the box full. And every time I've asked, they've given me 10 or 20 or in some cases 30 of these things. And then you can use them to just pick off, 
you know, the, the little spots where it's where it's really uh, was really st stuck on. Okay, now the fun part. Now you want to clean the rails. All right, this is the most expensive part of the thing because I use this block. It's called a Kratex rectangular polishing stick. The original is like this. I think it's three eighths thick by what's that? Four inches long, maybe inch and a half, two inches wide. Anyway, you just take that block and put it on the rails, paint and all, and just rub it down. And you'll see it only takes two or three brushes and it just takes the paint right off and leaves this shiny, shiny surface. The nice thing about this is a couple things. One, Kratex is the same company that makes Bright Boy. And this is just a Bright Boy that is not nearly as coarse. And as you know, if you've used Bright Boy, it puts some nasty grooves in your track. This polishes the track. Even though it's an abrasive, it's extra fine. It doesn't do any harm at all to the track. In fact, if you've got a, like a point on a turnout that's kind of rough, if you carefully rub it, you'll just smooth it right off. It's really slick. One, these are pricey, they're about 25 bucks a piece. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna order one, order it with a friend because the shipping's about the same amount, it's stupid, <laughs> but it'll last you forever. I, I gave you one, what, 10 years ago? At least 10 years ago. And you still got it, right? Still going? Gee, I wonder where that is. Uh, no, yeah, I know you I do, I know you do. Yeah. It's not worn down like yours is. Well, that's because I've used it more. But. Yeah. Anyway, and it also is, you know, the, the narrow side is good if, if you just want to do one rail. You just, you put, like if you're working on a turnout and you just want to do the one rail, you just turn on its side. So, all right. Um, and I put the reference in there where you can look up. I found two sources for the Kratex blocks. One is at Kratex themselves and another one is at Congress Tools. Again, the websites are in here if you want to follow them up. Uh, as I said, they're expensive, but they last forever. And then the last step is uh, I take Al's favorite tool, pan pastels. I happen to like Burt Sienna Extra Dark. Number 740.1, and I use these uh, um, cosmetic wedges, you've all seen these. Put a little bit on and just zap it down until I'm happy with the results. Sometimes I have, I will find out after the fact that I put too much of Martha Stewart on the, on the side of the ties and they're still too white. So I just take again one of these little tools, a little scraper, and just go down and scrape it individually off the six or eight or ten ties that are still too white. When you're all done, I'm, I'm, I was thinking about passing this around, it's pretty heavy, we can try it. This is the this is the end result. We can try this. If if you drop it, don't worry. It's not going all the way out. It didn't come out the way out. You can just take it. Pass. Clean up the aisles. So as I said, uh, the offer is I would like anybody who's interested to come up here and take a look at these ratios. And anybody that wants to try this tool, I'll show you how to use it, and uh, we, and we can do it. Any questions at all? Where did you purchase that tool for the online people? Which, which one? Where did you purchase your ballasting tool for the people who are going to Oh, I, bought, I got that. The process you can get on eBay. Yep. You can get the same thing from, who else? Somebody in the U.S. makes it. Process. Bachman makes it. Uh, process, it's uh, the spreader car with the shut off and height adjustment, which is this one. 49 bucks, including shipping on eBay today. And the other one is a Bachman. It looks identical. Same shut off and height, $71 plus shipping at Walters. And how do you spell that? Oh, it's all in here. Well, people P online can't see it. Oh, P-R-O-S-E-S, process. Um, what was I going to say? Can I interject? Yes. Well, while he's trying to find his place, you know, he mentioned Bright Boys. We all know what Bright Boys are, and he touched on this. The single most biggest problem in uh, stalling locomotives and stuff is because of dirty track. How does the track get dirty? It gets gunk on it. How does that happen? It's because there's minute scratches on the rail. You can't see them with your naked eye. 
you know, you know, with an optimizer, but it's there because the bright ways they leave leave that. So mm -hmm. that's why these Craytex things they're they're well, they're pricey, but boy, you polish your rails with those Craytex blocks is going to make a big difference. I, I can attest to that. Yeah, it's amazing too. After you will find sometimes I mentioned in here that. When you're all done, you know, before, you, before you've used the uh, pan pastel, you'll see, oh, damn it, there's a place here where uh, the ballast got washed away or sloughed off, and so I can see the cork, and I want to fix that. So in those cases, just one second here, Steve. You, I go back, and I just use almost straight glue and put it on the offending spot, and then I take my finger and just take a little bit of the ballast and push it in. And so it, it, you know, it's real thick glue, push it in, kind of smooth it out, and then after it's dried the next day, then I go back and I drizzle more over the top. Steve? How do you, how do, you do the outside rails with the, the bank? Uh, the, out, the outside of the... The slopes. Oh, the slopes? Yeah. Uh, again, I didn't do it, I didn't do it on, I did it on the paste that's going around. I, I pour enough so that it, it goes, you know, on your on your cork, it's got a, a bevel. Mm -hmm. I pour enough so that it goes down the bevel to the bottom of the bevel and then a little bit further, however far, you know, you want. I usually go maybe a quarter of an inch, maybe a little further. And then I go through with this brush on its side because if you try to brush this way, you'll end up exposing the cork again and again and again. So I've learned just to go down with the side of the brush and just kind of mush it down. You, you do it a couple times, Steve, and you'll, you'll see, oh yeah, side is the only way. Because you try to do it this way, you're going to end up with bare spots all, all along the rail. Because what I was thinking is that you would have, you know, because of gravity pulling it down, yes. how much you would put on there and just let it go down by itself? or you. I mostly let it go down by itself. And then because I'm putting the, the glue in between the rails, it's wicking down. Oh. It's not being sprayed down. Remember, it's just, it's going underneath the rail and it's wicking down. And you'll see it. You put it on. If we put it on right here, right now, you would see that this turns very dark and then it kind of wicks through a little bit. Put on a little bit more and it goes a little further, a little bit more. And you'll see it go right to the bottom of the, and to the point where you'll finally see uh, glue showing at the bottom. And you can either leave it there or you can, if you've got a paper towel, if it bothers you, you can, you know, Pick it up, but I just let it stay there. And dry. It'll be dry the next day. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty fast. Any other questions? Before you call the people up front, I'm just going to wrap this up. Yeah, we'll please. Yeah. Okay. So, are there any uh, anything else for the good of the order with the with the um, with the clinic tonight before we invite everybody up to try their hand at ballasting? I, I do remember I had one other thing <laughs> after I I had uh, Cliff set up his computer for me. I've got a couple of photos from my layout of the, the final shot. So I'll give credit where credit's due. That uh, cribbing in the background was done by my friend John O'Connell, who offered, he said, you need a cribbing in that spot, so he made one for me. And you can't see it so, as well in these photos as you can in the piece. That's it. You can turn the lights back on. Thanks. Uh, you can't see it as well as you could in the pieces going around, but that that other stuff that's on the on the layout that's just sand that's been sifted, and it, it to me it makes it look more real because you know you you get around railroad tracks, and it's all neat and tidy mostly between the rails and right outside, and then from there on it starts to get a little less tidy and a few weeds and some big rocks and some little rocks. And I think it does a pretty good job of, of doing that.